Hello, hello. Hi, YouTube. My name is James PFP. This is not a banjo cast. This is a straightforward video uh, to do with um, philosophical issues. That's the best thing I could say for it. It's to do with philosophical issues, and I have to refer to notes during the uh, proceedings here. And I also have a pointing device, which I'm going to be relying upon. The notes, I don't, however, I drew up earlier, and I've got a few online sources which I'll try to remember to link in the video description so that you can find out where I've been pulling all of the various uh, all the various things. But before we get there, this is a, I got in the background here a picture that I put up on Facebook not that long ago. Um, yeah, I made a few alterations, as you can see, to the picture. Maybe I should just, just get rid of my camera for a moment. Like I could, you know, hide my camera so you can see it here clearly. All your clams are belong to Zenu. <laughs> so yeah, uh, what's the topic for this evening? It's about logic gates and ethics, or in other words, not relatedness. Uh, if you don't know what I mean by not relatedness, I'm not that surprised. But uh, I have released other videos in the recent past, uh, which have to do with this very set of topics and what not relatedness being one of them <coughs> so I did have another window open here but I've got it uh, well I don't really actually need it I can make notes on the available space here I think on the on the page especially this large white area right here um, this is a Wikipedia article off to one side on the golden rule specifically the golden rule is uh, is under discussion here m merely because I was having a discussion earlier on this afternoon uh, with a person here in, that I know in my city about the golden rule specifically uh, basically because of uh, I guess I could write it down here this is regarding uh, I'm going to do it this way Christian uh, exceptionalism Christian exceptionalism, I, uh, because Jesus knows a golden rule or something, th this somehow separates him or makes him or Christianity stand apart because of its reliance upon the golden rule. Uh, this, as many people are, might be aware, oh, i got to remember now what keys do what. Okay, yellow, blue, and eraser. Excellent. And shift E to get rid of them all. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let me write down the title here. Logic <laughs> Gates and Ethics. So you know exactly what it is I said. Logic Gates and Ethics. Where, where's, where's the place where these two sets of concepts overlap? Because I could get into formal logic in a whole set of videos. Probably would take a year to go through all of the various types of logic gate so to speak but where is the inter the intersection or where is the interface is probably the even better way of saying it between logic and ethics and I say that it comes in the form of this construction not relatedness not relatedness as uh, so it's this not is a adjective. Maybe no, maybe it's an adverb. I don't know. Adver it can't be an adverb. It's an adjective. It's a description of this relatedness. And to be not related, therefore, is to still be somehow related. Uh, how would I otherwise describe this? could also describe it as a exercise in negative space. If I was, for example, to start from, uh, um, if I was sketching a picture of a chair, I could look at the chair as a positive form, uh, like I've got a computer chair just across the from where I'm looking at. I could look at it as a positive form, which is combined of a shape like this, and then there's another shape down below, which curves around like this, and then there's another shape over here, and then there's this other shape. This is a positive description of this thing I'm calling a chair, which has a form not unlike this. But I could also think of the chair that I just drew as being described by its negative space. I could look and say, well, I can see this, the space which is left over 
around these various forms. And if I was to describe that negative space, I would also get a picture of the chair. All in one go, so to speak, because, because everything which is not the chair is not the chair. So I could think of, just to reiterate this, I could think of the description, uh, like my description, my drawing of a chair from the two points of view is either a series of Boolean additions of this shape plus this shape plus this shape minus these intersections, never mind, the intersections I want to cover over or color in to get rid of them. Or I could do it all in one go by saying everything which is not the chair, I will draw that limit first. So, that's the first thing. I'll put this another way, formally, at the very beginning of what I'm doing here. One, we have the Venn style diagram where there's this circle, and on the inside of the circle is us. And then two, everything which is not us is therefore describable as such. It's on the outside of the circle, therefore it is not us. But we also have other words for this concept. Them. Another one from antiquity would be to call them barbarians, describing how their language, what that not us language sounds like in our ears, is to call them by what they sound like example, and etc. And then three, by the rules of formal logic, any, if I could show this to be true, not, not us, exactly or equals <laughs> us. That, that is to say, I can use the not gate or the not description twice on that which is not us. And if I do that operation, or if I could figure out a way of making that the case, that which is not us will become us, or become understood by us, or will, be, will exist in intersection with us in a new way than this not us description. So in a sense, this formal claim by logic, this formal logical, uh, what would I say, idealism, this formal logical ideal, if we could show it in the sense that, uh, how else will I show this, this formal logical ideal, I could use it in formal logical terms, but I don't want to... Uh, run off the page here. A and B, I think, something like that. Not not us is A and B is us. They have to be equal for this to be true. Or in any way, any way, shape or form. That's the first part. So the next part of this oh, all right. Uh, the next part of this discussion comes here to Wikipedia, and as I say, the link will be in the description. I'm going to read from here nice and quickly, just because it's quicker this way. I don't need to go much farther than the top of the article for my main point, which is that generally this golden rule, which we're going to be con considering for the purposes of the intersection between logic and ethics, has got... Uh, this particular curious feature which is really well understood and really well documented. The golden rule which can be considered a law of reciprocity in some religions is the principle of treating others as one would wish to be treated. Very carefully worded to be, to be in line with the third version here. It is a maxim that is found in many religions and cultures. The maxim may appear as either a positive or negative injunction governing conduct. 
Aha. One should treat others as one would le like others to treat oneself, the positive or directive form. Two, one should not treat others in ways that one would not like to be treated, the negative or prohibitive form. Again, with the same uh, footnote. And the third, what you wish upon others, you wish upon yourself, the empathic or responsive form. Again, the same uh, source is linked for all three of these forms. I'm going to read the source out here. Golden Rule, a dictionary of philosophy. Uh, it's from Anthony Few, et editor of a Dictionary of Philosophy, and this is under the heading Golden Rule. Dictionary contains the following quote under the entry. The maxim, treat others how you wish to be treated, various expressions of the rule exist in the tenets of most religions and creeds throughout the ages, testifying to its universal applicability. Or, if you ask me, it's extreme age. It's, it's very old, this rule. Uh, so m much older than the Iron Age, probably older than the Bronze Age. But because of the, irons a the Iron Age, we can be darn sure it was prolific throughout the, the Bronze Age. Or at least that's how I read the, the histories. I think the, the Iron Age in particular forced the Golden Rule uh, to become universalized, otherwise there was going to be much more major issues between societies. And part of the issue in particular with this Golden Rule that, that I'm raising right now is that there's this positive form and this negative form. It says here that the what you wish upon others, you wish upon yourself, the empathic or responsive form, it says that this is the empathic form, but I, I don't agree with this particular uh, Wikipedia article for this very reason. I should probably be writing on the talk page up here about this very first claim, which isn't well sourced as far as I'm concerned. The empathic form, if you ask me, is actually the negative form. And now I'm going to show you how, uh, why I think that. The number one reason I think it is because negative expressions are older, more common, and generally more empathic by demonstration. They use negative emotions in order to make the point, but uh, they're not necessarily... I don't think that they're somehow intrinsically less valuable than some positive statement merely because positivity is somehow better than negativity. Let me prove to you why I think this is the case. It is borne out by uh, this entire... Um, this entire article's evidence. But I, I'm going to write this down before we get down into the article. You can see it all listed out over here. In fact, I, I'm just going to start circling them. we got ancient Egypt here, ancient India underneath it with two subdivisions, ancient Greece, ancient Persia, and ancient Rome all having a version of the Golden Rule. And then, in religious, specifically religious context, Abrahamic religions with Judaism and Christianity normally being linked together under the title Judeo, ex -gen. so the Ju Judeo-Christian, then Islam and the Baha'i faith, uh, both of them very definitively separated. <coughs> and then under Indian religions, which are to some degree found up here, as separated from East Asian religions. East Asian religions, Confucianism, Taoism, these are, if you ask me, the ones which have the, the greatest reach into the, the, the West. Those are the ones that I'm most familiar with. And then uh, farther down on the list, I only noticed this when I was getting ready to make the video, we have Scientology. I'm going to get back to Scientology. This will really put the nail into the coffin, if you ask me. When we get to talk about Scientology here, we, we can all have a, a fine laugh. Oh, why did I make a list of that listing uh, like that? Here, uh, let me do it for you again. I'm going to write them down this time. Um, we got Judeo-Christian. As I'm going to make a short list, essentially. We've got Egypt. We have got India, we've got Greece, all these listed under ancient here, if you notice, antiquity. And we have Persia, and we have Rome. It just so happens that the way I've list, listed them down here, they more or less 
fall, if I, if I was to flip them around, if I was to turn them around the other way, they'd fall on geographical lines. This is the west. This is the east. Normally called the Middle East. Uh, maybe not the Far East, but yeah, the Far East and then also the Middle East. So Middle East, Middle East, Far East. This is west because it's in Africa. It's definitely west. It's in the Mediterranean, although it's on the border with the west. It's almost as far east, west as the Judeo-Christian group. But we'll get back to that. And then Rome, which is very definitely western. Let me make a small alteration to this uh, set here. I'm going to put a double line under India as being where I suspect the um, Iron Age began. Let me put a single line under the next three eldest places on the list in terms of cultures. Egypt probably goes back as far as India, but India had an Iron Age before Egypt did. Followed by the Judeo part of the Judeo-Christian expression. And then the youngest of all, we've got the Christians, we've got the Greeks, we've got the Romans. These guys are basically concurrent with these guys, and both of them are influenced by these guys. So the Iron Age begins here, is the thing that, that I would keep in mind when it comes to the Golden Rule. Let's take a quick look at some of what this article claims for these various ancient places and also ancient religions or current religions. Possibly earliest affirmation in Egypt, Egypt of the maximum of re reciprocity dating back to or, or you know, 2,000 two years prior to the Common Era. Uh, reflecting the ancient Egyptian god goddess Mat appears in the story of the eloquent peasant which dates to the Middle Kingdom. Now this is the command do to the doer to make him do. Proverb embodies the do at desk principle. The, a late period, i.e. during the period when Greeks had conquered the Mediterranean and parts of the Near East, you know, post-Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic Egypt, late period, papyrus contains the early negative affirmation of the golden rule. Again, remember there's positive affirmations and negative, and I'm going to ask you, which do you consider, as, you, as you're watching the video, which of the two do you consider to be more empathic, the positive or the negative? That which you hate to be done to you, do not do to another. Which is more empathic, do to the doer to make him do, or that which you hate to be done to yourself, do not do to another? I, I ask you, which of the two is more empathic? Ancient e India, Sanskrit tr tradition, ancient ep epic of India, there's a discourse which a wise minister, Viduru, adv adv or advises the king, Yudhisthira, uh, yud Yudhisthira. Uh, all words are balanced in Dharma. All worlds are balanced on Dharma. Dharma encompasses the way of the prosperity as well. O king, Dharma is the best quality to have. Wealth to the medium and desire the lowest. H hence, keeping these in mind by self-control and by making Dharma, right conduct, your main focus, treat others as you treat yourself. So it's a positive affirmation, much in the way that we would find one uh, find it in, say, uh, Judeo-Christian context. We're going to get to that shortly. The Tamil tradition, which is much younger, we can see it's 200 BC to 500 AD, well into the Iron Age that's reached to the West. Ancient Greece, speaking of this Iron Age that was creeping into the West, this is where the Greeks come in. Golden rule is in, in its prohibitive or negative form is common principle or was a common principle in ancient Greek philosophy. I, I draw this to your attention because indeed the Greeks influenced the Romans and in turn the Christians. Example of the general concept include avoid doing what you would blame others for doing. That's from Thales of Miletus, 600 to 500 BCE and possibly one of the more likely to actually have existed of the great sages of Greece. I mean, I mean to say, not that there's much doubt about the seven sages, but the, 
the Greek sages are far more likely to have existed than, say, the Greek heroes, um, uh, I don't know, Achilles or Odysseus. Another negative statement, what you do not want to happen to you, you do not do it to yourself either. Sextus the Pythagorean, the oldest extant reference to Sextus is by Origen in the 3rd century of the Common Era, so it takes, it takes a while to emerge into the record again. And then the third one from Isocrates, do not do to others that which angers you when they do it to you, which I think is possibly the most clear, clear statement of a, of a, um, is a very clear statement of the negative form, but which is very empathic in its interpretation. To me, that's quite empathic. Do not do to others that which angers you when they do it to you. If you understand how it would make you feel and that it should make them feel much the same way, you have every reason to not do something. Ancient Persia, the Pavli texts of Zoroastrianism, BCE 300 to around 1000 AD, were, the, were an early source for the Golden Rule. So this is during the period immediately preceding Christianity and leading into it, becoming fairly common. Uh, that nature alone is good which refrains from doing that to another whatsoever is not good for itself, or whatever is disagreeable to yourself do not do unto others. Ancient Rome, Seneca the Younger, uh, just at the turn of the Common Era, practitioner of Stoicism, which itself was, was a Greek uh, philosophical trend or family of a school of ethics, expressed the golden rule in his essay regarding the treatment of slaves. Re regarding the treatment of slaves, I will... Draw your attention back to this very point, since it pertains to Rome. Treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you. Or, in other words, uh, to really put this into stark context with what's sometimes considered to be occult teaching, as above, so below. Remembering that, uh, how, how else would I put this? Actually, I should probably really try to describe this well because it made me think quite straightly earlier. Fairly like, easy to keep this rectified. Um, treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you. If, if we were capable of making a trip back into time, say m only ab about 500 years ago, to as as people of the 21st century, and we could go back to India 500 years ago in our past, prior to major European recontact with, with the various um, uh, groups which would be found in Asia, all of which had been developing all along their own lines. If we were to go back to India at that period and observe the highly developed caste system, you know, un uninterrupted by European or the rest of the world's contact, would we not see the same thing in advance, in evidence, that the people who were of a middle social class would be intensely aware of how their superiors were, would treat them and also intensely aware of how to behave for their immediate inferiors in a very rigid and highly developed caste system? And, th and that's entirely what, to me, what it is about here is that there's a caste system in, e in existence and Rome makes no attempt to hide it. Uh, it's in particularly in regarding the treatment of slaves, treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you. And I, uh, so I ask you, uh, is, the Christians, is the Christian tendency towards the positive statement of much the same type of ethic really that radical or different? In fact, is it radical at all? Is it not supportive of this same ethic from ancient Rome and Seneca the Younger? Abrahamic religions. This is really interesting. A rule of altruistic reciprocity was, the first, stated, was first stated positively in a well-known Torah verse. Hebrew is the statement. It's from Leviticus. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your kinsfolk. Love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. So from Leviticus 19, uh, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your kinsfolk. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's interesting that we have this, we have this, pr we, ha we have this in interesting dichotomy almost set up 
because we're going to get back to it when we get into the Judeo part. Kinsfolk neighbor. What is my neighbor is the question that Jesus has to answer. Well, I'm going to use the Gospel of Luke to attempt an answer. Hillel the Elder, 100 B.C., uh, who lived until 10 AD, he used this verse as the most important message of the Torah in his teachings. Once he was challenged by a Gentile who asked to be converted under the condition the Torah be explained to him while he stood on one foot. This is an interesting claim which should have an associated note. I guess it comes here from the Bal Babylonian Talmud, the Shabbat folio. This is, this is the explicit reference to this entire story here. The Torah be explained to him while he stood on one foot, which is, if you ask me, a request to have the Torah explained to him in a very short period of time. The time, because you can't stand on one foot for too long. Hillel accepted him as a candidate for conversion to Judaism, but drawing on Leviticus 19, 18, briefed the man, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah, the rest is explanation, go and learn. In other words, he reiterated, the positive love your neighbor as yourself in the negative form because it is what? It is more empathetic. What is hateful to you, you do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. What is hateful to, do, to you, you do not do to your fellow, whatever your fellow is. Hillel recognized brotherly love as the fundamental principle of Jewish ethics. I'm going to leave it at that for the Jewish part. The Christian part. Golden rule was given by Jesus of Nazareth who used it to summarize the Torah. Do to others what you want them to do to you. And this is the meaning of the law of Moses and the teaching of the prophets. That's from first, uh, first coming from Matthew, but from Luke 6, specifically 31. I'm going to go to Luke th 6 for a moment. Here's an interesting to notice interesting thing to notice about the Gospel of Luke. I was trying to think of ways of describing it earlier. Uh, Luke is, uh, how to put it? Oh, right. It's a semi-veiled um, golden Gnosticism, or it's, it's, it's a version of Christianity which isn't squarely in one, in one camp or another, in the way I interpret it. There are features of it which are Gnostic, but there are, there are other features of it which make it far more uh, political in its, in its use and, or in its expression. I'll attempt to show you what I mean when I say that. It's, it's not as Gnostic as the Gospel of John, is what I'm really trying to say, in the sense that the explanations are almost as esoteric as the original parables. But in the Gospel of Luke, explanations can frequently be found by referring to a later chapter, and it's not hard to find where that chapter is going to be if you know where you're starting. For example, if we look at chapter 6 of Luke, where the particular verse which we just looked at comes from, and as ye would, have, and as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to like to them likewise? Where I'm using the King James version simply for um, for comedic effect, I guess. But where did this come from? This this particular chapter, and it came to pass the second Sabbath after the first, he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn, did not eat, or did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said to them, Why do you that? Why do you do that which is not lawful on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read so much as this, what David did when himself was hungry, uh, and they that, were which, they that were with him? In other words, uh, this is a series of parables will now be told, or a series of battles between Jesus and the Pharisees, or the teachers of the law. The scribes of the Pharisees watched him whether or not he would uh, heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find another accusation against him, which he does. Then we get a listing of the calling of the 12, apostle, uh, 12 apostles, apostles, Simon, who is named Peter, so on and so forth. And then the, they that were vexed with unclean spirits, they were healed. A uh, whole multitude sought to touch him, there, there were, and there, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Uh, this is reiterated in the Gospel of Luke and other places. The old beggar woman who's healed when she touches his cloak, I believe, that's in the Gospel of Luke. 
And he lifted his eyes, the disciples said, Blessed are ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So here's the Beatitudes in line in this same set. This would accord with what, Matthew 5? So it's not as Gnostic as the rest. Uh, Blessed are ye that hunger now, so you, sh you shall be filled. Blessed are the poor, yours is the kingdom of God. Not the poor in spirit, but the poor. Blessed are ye that weep, for now, or you shall laugh later. Blessed are ye when men hate you, they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast, you out, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. And rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Uh, woe unto the rich, you've received your consolation already. Well, I guess they have. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now. So there's a total reversal of anyone who has the uh, desired value in the end. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies and do good to them which hate you. This is verse 27 leading into 31. Bless them that curse you, play them, or pray for them which uh, despitefully use you. And unto them that smiteth thee in the one cheek offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid him not to take thy coat as well. Give them to every man that asketh of thee. And them that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as you would, uh, and as you would that men should do unto you, do unto they them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank ye have ye? For sinners, for sinners will also love those that uh, love them. So as I was, I was saying earlier in this video here, um, the not relatedness problem is is something which they were at, at the time aware of. That what we do for one another. Um, we also have, to some degree, these others, just not us, to deal with. And this is where the concept of neighbor has been introduced. Not us, neighbor, is what the Pharisee was asking Jesus about. You will get to that in a second, but where do we get to that? Oh, it just so happens we get to that in Luke chapter 12. In the meantime, they were gathered together in an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch they trod on one another. Remember, we just heard the Beatitudes a minute ago, which is a bit like the Sermon on the Mount. Well, here's another multitude following after them. So much they trod on one another and began to say unto his disciples, First of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and nothing hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever have you spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which you've spoken in the ear and closets shall be proclaimed on housetops. And I say to you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more than they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Hey, yea, I say unto you, fear him. So he was speaking of himself there, presumably. Unto the very, uh, your very heads are, hairs of your head are number. Fear not also, ye are more valuable than many sparrows. So that these are sayings of Jesus been, that have been wrapped together into a particularly, maybe not vitriolic uh, sermon, but a pointed one. Uh, he spake a parable unto them, saying, A certain, a grant of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room wh where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I, will I do. I'll put down my barns and build greater, and there shall I bestow all my fruits and goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast many goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be, whom, which thou hast provided? So it is that he that layeth up tre treasure for himself, he is not rich towards God. In other words, wastefulness is... A bad thing and would continue to be considered a bad thing for a very long time <laughs> and he said unto his disciples therefore I say to you, unto you take no thought of your life and what you shall eat neither for your body or what you shall put on consider the ravens for they neither sow nor reap consider the lilies of the field so on and so forth uh, again you'll find all of these sections in related places in Matthew but used in a different order than you'll find here in Luke but Chapter 6, chapter 12. Notice that. Uh, and blessed are those servants. Chapter... 
Uh, for where your treasure is, okay, so we'll start at chapter, or, sorry, verse 34. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves, like unto the men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open the door immediately. Blessed are those servants. The word servants from the King James Version could also mean slaves. Whom the Lord, whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say to you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them himself as if it were a Saturnalia. 30, verse 38, And he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. Again, that could also be slaves. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, they would have watched and not suffered had his house been broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour which ye think not. Uh, notice that nobody knows when is a negative statement. It's not a positive claim. Nobody knows the time or the hour. Uh, blessed is, and the Lord said, uh, Who then is faithful and a wise steward when his Lord shall make the ruler over his household and give their portion of meat in due season? Again, well, I suppose, not maybe not again, but we could look at John Locke here and find many of these same, same arguments being made. But what he but he that knew not did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. So oh, hang on a second. Here's a funny parable to find in Luke. But I am come to send fire to the earth, verse forty nine. And what will I if I already if if it be already killed and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Verse 51, suppose ye that I've come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. For he comes to bring not peace, but a sword is the verse you'll find in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you think that gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is not into the game of misusing the positive statement of who, what you should do for your neighbor, I think we should take this into uh, stark consideration against the evidence of Luke chapter 6. Uh, Luke chapter 12 says, suppose that if he's come to give peace on earth, he tells you nay, but rather division. From henceforth there should be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. Father divided against son, son against the father, the mother against the daughter, daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And he said he also to the people, when they see a cloud rise out of the west straight away, you say, there cometh a shower, and so it is. So how about one other place? On the golden rule, we also find the, a similar passage which parallels called the Great Commandment, which is in Luke chapter 10. And one day an authority of the law stood up and put Jesus to the test and said, Teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? And he answers with a verse from Deuteronomy. What's written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you understand it? He answered, Above, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, all your strength and all your mind, Deuteronomy. And then love your neighbor as yourself, which is the second verse from Deuteronomy. Is that 19, 18 again? You have answered correctly, says Jesus. Do that and you will live. So who is my neighbor is the follow-up to this passage in Luke chapter 10. I suggest that Luke chapter 10 should be read in parallel with Luke chapter 4 or perhaps Luke chapter 5. I think Luke chapter 4 is much more likely. I'm not going to touch on Islam for the time being, although I, it, it might be an interesting read. Um, Muslim is far, Islam, sorry, Muslim. Islam is the youngest. It's not, it's not the... It's not the most primitive because it's the youngest. It's the one that's had the least amount of time to develop its individual identity separate from everything else which came before it and which it largely uh, appropriated or assumed due to its positioning in time, i.e. it's pretty young. From the Hadith, the collected oral and written accounts of Muhammad and his teachings. A uh, Bedouin came to the Prophet, grabbed the stirrup of his camel and said, O Messenger, Teach me something to go to heaven with it. And the prophet said, as you would have people do to you, do it to them. And what you dislike be done to you, don't do to them. So he, he states both the positive and the negative. 
Now let the stirrup go. If the maxim is enough for you, go and act in accordance to it. Again, the prophet here doesn't know anything other than any innumerable number of prophets which have proceeded in the last 1,500 years prior to him would have known. And the if you, if you can't understand the implicit relationship with the positive statement, you are guaranteed to understand the negative one. That what you wish, wish you wish for or want for yourself, seek for mankind. That's an interesting one. The Baha'i, blessed is he who prefers his brother before himself. Son of man, deny not my servant, he ask anything of thee, for his face is my face. Thou art God, in other words. If thine eyes be turned towards justice, choose for, for thou for thy neighbor that which thou choosest for thyself. Hinduism, one should never do that to another which regards uh, one regards as injurious to one's own self. One should never do that to another which one regards as injurious to one's own self. That's a, a direct negative statement of the golden rule. This, in brief, is the rule of dharma. That's what they want to call dharma. If you, if you like the positive statement of the golden rule, you're a Christian. If you like the negative statement of the golden rule, the chances are you're a dharma bum. Other behavior is due to selfish desires. And I would tend to agree with that. The positive statement is a selfish statement. The negative statement is an empathic statement. By making dharma right conduct your main focus, treat others as you treat yourself. An interesting use of words there, treat others as you treat yourself. We'll get back to that one due to Scientology. Buddhism. Buddha or Siddhartha, uh, Gautama, Ga, uh, Gautata, Gautama, sorry, made the principle one of the cor uh, cornerstones of the ethics of the sec in the sixth century BC. It occurs in many places in other forms throughout the trip, Tripitaka, the Tripitaka. Comparing oneself to others in such terms as just as I am, so are they; just as they are, so am I. He should neither kill nor cause others to kill, or one who, while himself seeking happiness, oppresses with violence other beings who also desire happiness, will not attain happiness hereafter. A third time, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Putting oneself in the place of another, one should not kill nor cause another to kill. Jainism doesn't interest me too much. I'm going to skip down here to Confucianism and then Taoism. What you do not wish for yourself do not do to others. And then Zigong, a disciple of Confucius, asked, is there any one word that could guide a person throughout life? The master replied, how could Shu, how about Shu, rep reciprocity, never impose on others that which you would not choose for yourself? In other words, a negative statement in order to make it critically empathic in the sense that it, it, its reference point, oneself, isn't necessarily the thing which is held up most of all, but it's the standard by which you're going to judge what will be correct or incorrect behavior. The same idea is presented uh, V12 or say in, uh, okay, presented in whatever the V stands for, book five and six of the Analects, which can be found in online ch Chinese text project. Phraseology differs from the Christian version of the Golden Rule does not presume to do anything unto others, but merely to avoid doing that which would be harmful. Does not preclude doing good deeds and taking moral positions, but there's a slim possibility for a Confucian mi missionary outlook, such as one could justify with the Christian Golden Rule. Huh. <coughs> Taoism. Here is where I fall in. Uh, this is where I, I fell into Discordianism. Discordians make no apologies for their Taoistic. Uh, tendencies. From the Tao Te Ching, chapter 49, the sage has no interest of his own, but takes the interest of the people as his own. He is kind to the kind. He is also kind to the unkind, for virtue is kind. He is faithful to the faithful. He is faithful also to the unfaithful, for virtue is faithful. The point is that he is going to be whatever the virtue demands of him, kind to all faithful to all. Regard your neighbor's gain as your own gain and your neighbor's loss as your own loss is the second 
way of interpreting that. Uh, and I'm going to pull in a third one, which I find I found in a fortune cookie many, many years ago, and it made me really laugh hard when I recognized that, ethically speaking, this is a positive statement which is in incredibly selfish. Helping a friend is like helping yourself. Found that in a fortune cookie. Frankly selfish. Helping a friend is like helping yourself. Frankly selfish. But wait on a second here. Look at Scientology. We've got a patently false application of the golden rule in Scientology because it embraces a prevarication that everyone who knows that yoga said it's bad, that everyone knows Yo Yoda said is bad, okay? Ver like a, a series of, in the way of happiness, a series of precepts are laid out by L. Ron Hubbard. And he, L. Ron expressed the golden rule in his both negative and prohibitive form and his positive form. Precept 19, the negative form, try not to do things to others that you would not like them to do to you. And then precept 20, the positive form of the same rule, try to treat others as you would want them to treat you. And when I was writing this down, I started to laugh. Try not to do things to others, dot, 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 number 19. And then number 20, try, in brackets, to do things to others. No, that doesn't work. Try to treat others as if treat. Treat. We saw a treat a minute ago in another uh, series, but wh why? when was the last time a Scientologist treated you to anything that you didn't have to pay for? So what does this Wikipedia article avoid? I'll tell you what I think it avoids. It avoids Nietzsche, Nietzsche's contribution to this entire discussion, um, which we would find in the genealogy of morals, basically summed up by this particular concept, master-slave morality. The MSM morality, or the MS morality. On the genealogy of mor morals, uh, this master slave morality is a central theme of Frederick Nietzsche's work, in particular his first essay on the genealogy of morality, or on morals. Nietzsche argued that there were two fundamental types of mor morality master morality and slave morality. Master morality values, I'm going to make just a, a list here. We got master on one side, we got slave on the other. Values, uh, this is a list of values for both. So this one values pride and power, while this one values things like kindness and empathy. It also includes sympathy with that, but I, I'm going to let empathy and sympathy stand in for basically the same thing. But then he follows it up. Master weighs actions on good or bad consequences. So actions be good and bad, good or bad, and actions be good or evil intentions. Outcome, intent. This is the major difference between the two. And this is why I say the negative expressions of the golden rule tend to fall on this side of the coin, not on this side. And the positive expressions of the golden rule will fall on this side of the coin and be directly supportive of that side. See also uh, a second more or less hu more or less universal rule for human activity monkey see monkey do if you ask me that's the actual basis for the golden rule in either its positive or its negative form most likely in its negative form it's because monkey see monkey do that we have this interpret that we have the ability to interpret ourselves in the place of the other it's because monkey see monkey do that we, we get this sense of not relatedness. We see, we see how we're not them. We, we, this is us. That's them that we're watching. But if we watch them long enough, we begin to become them. And then if, if, if that's not the case, well, if that is the case, are we not them? So 
so that's the basic lead up to discussions on the golden rule. So master-slave morality, golden rule. Was there anything else that I had to go over here for this? I think I managed to go through it all in one fell swoop. So, yeah, as I said, there'll be links in the description. If you have any questions about the things that I've been going on with, particular, in particular, leave a comment below, give me a link, or give me a time code to the specific point so I can find out what it is you're specifically want, wondering about, or if perhaps you've missed something which I said immediately beforehand, or if I'd forgotten to say something, which I might wanted to have added. Oh, there is other things that I wanted to say, though. I'm going to stop recording now so I can get these other things organized. <laughs>